welcome to another video. Hope you're ready to flex those brain muscles. This is a continuation of the last video. We're talking about inverse functions. So we're gonna get a little bit deeper into it and do some tougher examples in this video. So if you're brand new, you need to just review inverse functions from the beginning, then go ahead and click that last video. If not, if you wanna dig a little deeper and challenge yourself, then stay tuned. This video is perfect for you. So let's just review what we've learned in the last video. Inverse function. So first of all, a function must be one-to-one -one for it to have an inverse or to find an inverse. One-to-one -one meaning it is a function, right? Each input has its own output. It passes the vertical line test and it's one-to-one. -one. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the domain and range. So each output is the result of exactly one input. It passes the horizontal line test, all right? So we also learned that the domain of a function is the same as the range of its inverse and the range of a function is the same as the domain of its inverse. You just swap them, right? This is really useful when we get to future examples where we have to find the domain and range of a function and its inverse. We'll see that in just a second. We also learned about composite functions. So if you compose a function and its inverse, whether the original is in the inside function or the inverse is in the inside function, either way you should get x, right? The inverse, what it does is it reverses whatever is being done to x. So you're just gonna be left with x and this works for both cases. So if you need to verify that a function and another function are inverses of each other, you just basically do both of these composite functions and see if you get x for both. And if you do, then they are inverses of each other. Lastly, and I actually missed this in the last video, I'm so sorry, but uh, a function and its inverse are symmetrical over the line y equals x. So a lot of these problems, when we get to more complicated inverses, it's hard to see how it's symmetrical over the line y equals x, but this is still good to note. And this is a little bit simpler of an example. We have two linear equations. And as you can see, this is the line y equals x, and they reflect over that line. So this can be useful. You can see it come up on quizzes and exams and stuff. All right, so we're gonna do some examples where we find the inverse of some functions. These are the steps we're gonna use. I don't have enough board space to keep this up the whole time, so if you need to screenshot this or write it down, but you probably have the idea of this already. I'll just quickly go through it. Replace f of x with y. y is just easier to look at, easier to deal with, so we do it to make it a little easier on ourselves. Swap the x's and the y's. Anywhere where you see an x, replace it with y. Anywhere you see y, replace it with x. Now we solve for y. What I mean by solve for y is we want to get y by itself on one side. y equals stuff, right? And what this y equals stuff is, that's actually the equation of our inverse function. So we just finally, we just replace y with this inverse notation, showing that we have indeed found the inverse, okay? So these are the steps we're going to use, and we're going to do some examples right now. All right, this here's our first example. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this function, we're going to find the inverse, we're going to verify that those functions are inverses of each other, and then we're going to find the domain and range of this function as well as its inverse. So this is great practice. If you want to pause the video, try it on your own, then press, press play if you either get stuck or if you want to check your answer. So I'm going to go ahead and start here with part one, find the inverse. So remember my first step is I'm going to copy this down, but I'm replacing f of x with y just because... It's a little bit easier to look at, the notation's a little better. So now what do I do? I swap the x and the y, and I don't do any algebra to do this. I literally just replace y with x, and replace x with y. Okay? Now what I'm doing is I'm solving for this new y, remember? So I'm gonna multiply both sides by y plus three, just to get rid of that fraction. y plus three, sorry, that's a little messy there. So that gets rid of this fraction, and I'm left with y plus three times x equals what, one, right? I'm gonna distribute this x into here. That's x times y plus three times x. So I have x, y plus three x equals one. Now remember, I'm just solving for this y. So this three x I can move over, minus three x, minus 3x, that leaves me with what? x, y, these cancel out, I'm left with equals, I'm gonna write negative 3x plus one, just cause, I don't know, I, personal preference, I prefer to see it like this. Now my last step is just divide both sides by x to get the y by itself. So now where am I at? I have y equals negative 3x plus one, all over x. Remember, there's one more step though, because this is the inverse of this function, or so we think until we verify, but we're 99% sure, right? We're pretty sure we did this right. So I just replaced the y with inverse notation because it is the inverse 
So this is the inverse of f, that is f, okay? Negative 3x plus 1 over x. Okay, now we're doing part two, verify. Remember how we verify that a function and another function are inverses of each other? We do a composite function. First, we have our inner function as the inverse, and then we're gonna do our inner function as the original, right? So basically, we're plugging the original into the inverse and vice versa, and what should we get out? Well, we're hoping to get out x, okay? That's the goal, and if we do get out x, then we can confirm, we can verify that these are inverses of each other. So I'm plugging the inverse into f, so I'm plugging this whole function into f. I have one over, and if you need some practice with uh, composite functions, I have some videos on that as well if you wanna check those out, but that's exactly what we're doing is composing two functions, basically plugging one into the other. So what I'm doing here is anywhere where I see an x, I'm replacing it with this inverse of x. So this is what I have now, and what else do I have in the bottom? Plus three, okay? That's a one up top. So now, again, once we get to this point, this is all just algebra from here. There's many different ways to go about this. I'm just gonna do the way that I think is easiest, but any way that gets you to the right answer is a good way for you to use, whatever you understand. So I'm gonna do x over one over x over one, because this is just one, and I can multiply by any form of one, right? And that'll get rid of this denominator here, that's my goal. So up top I have x, one times x over one, that's just x. Down here I have, let's see, this x, this is being distributed to everything. So I have x times negative three x plus one over x, that gets rid of the denominator. Negative three x plus one. And then I have what, plus three times x, that's plus three x. I can simplify my like terms on the bottom, minus three x plus three x, I'm left with x over one, which is just x. So now we can do the other way around, and I'm hoping I have enough board space if I maybe start down here, I'm gonna switch colors. So now instead of plugging the inverse into the original, we are plugging the original into the inverse. Inverse with the original function inside, okay. So now we're taking one over x plus three and plugging it in for x and this function. So we have negative three times one over x plus three plus one all over x. No, not over x, right? Everywhere we see x, we replace it with this. That's a common mistake because people will see one x, they'll, they'll plug it in and they'll forget to plug in for the other x. So make sure you plug in to both x's. All right, so what am I gonna multiply by? Well, I'm personally gonna do x plus three over one over x plus three over one. And again, the reasoning is to, to get rid of, it gets rid of this whole thing actually, this just becomes one on the bottom. What are we left with on top, let's see. And remember, this multiplies to the whole thing x plus three over one, when it goes to this guy, it actually cancels this whole thing as well, right? So I'm left with just the negative three out there. And you could have distributed the negative three in and then canceled the x plus threes as well. That would give you the same answer. So that cancels that, I'm left with a negative three plus one times x plus three. So that's plus x plus three. And you can see what's gonna happen here. The minus three plus three cancels and I'm left with x. So we have verified that these two functions are inverses of each other. All right, so lastly, we're gonna find the domain and range of the original function as well as its inverse. And remember the relationship between these, right? This domain of the original function is equal to the range of the inverse, and the range of the original function is equal to this domain. So my personal strategy usually, I personally think that domain is easier to find than range. With range, sometimes you have to graph, you have to draw out a little line, and it's, it's harder to find with domain. You're just looking for things that make zeros in the denominator or negatives under square roots, and you exclude those values. It's a little bit easier, I think. So what I do is I find the domain of both these, and I just write the range of this as the domain of this, right, and the range of this as the domain. So if you get both the domains, you can get both the ranges by just swapping them. And you'll see what I mean in just a second. So first I'm gonna do the domain of this f of x. What can't I plug into this, right? What makes the denominator zero? That's just negative three. So the domain of this is actually all real numbers except for negative three. We can go from negative infinity to negative three, union negative three to infinity, which means that what? That's the range of my inverse function. So my inverse function goes from negative infinity to negative three, and union from negative three to infinity, 
And let's think about why this is real quick. We'll just note this. You remember the horizontal asymptote rule when they have the same leading uh, powers, right? X to the one, X to the one. You take the leading coefficient and that's the horizontal asymptote. So this has a horizontal asymptote at Y equals negative three. And that's why the range never actually touches negative three. So that's kind of cool to note this pattern. So what about the domain of this guy? Well, we can't plug in zero, right? So all other values other than zero. So we go from negative infinity to zero. Union, pick back up at zero and go to infinity. So that means the range of this guy is from negative infinity to zero. And then again, from zero to negative infinity. And you can notice why. If you remember your rules for horizontal asymptotes, again, we have this x on the bottom, right? So this can actually never be zero. No matter what you plug in for x, this will never be zero. And that's just our rules. We have a constant on top and we have, you know, an x on the bottom. That means the horizontal asymptote is at zero. And this can actually never be zero. So that's the basic idea. But hopefully this makes sense and you can find the domain, the range. All right, second example, if you got some good practice from the first example, again, I encourage you to pause the video, try this on your own. So I'll go ahead and start. We're gonna find the inverse. I went in and wrote out our first step. I just replaced f of x with y. Now I'm gonna switch the position of x and y. And again, anywhere where I see an x, I replace it with y. So I actually have two y's. And that's why I did this example, because it gets a little tricky to solve for y when there's two y's, okay? So first thing I'm just gonna do is eliminate this denominator by both, multiplying both sides by y minus two y minus 2, okay? And that gets rid of this denominator. I'm just left with y plus 1 on the right-hand side. And now I have y minus 2 times x on the left-hand side. I can distribute this x similar to our last example, and I have x times y minus 2 times x equals y plus 1. So now here's where students get stuck a lot. They see two different places with y. Maybe they'll solve for this y, but then they'll realize they still have a y here, right? And there's a trick. Anytime you have two or more y's, everything with y, you get to one side of the equation. Everything else, you get to the other. And then you actually end up factoring out a y and then dividing both sides by what, whatever's left over when you factor out that y. And I'll show you how it works right now. So if we subtract y to both sides, we get x, y, minus y minus y minus 2x equals 1. Now I can add 2x to both sides. Remember, we're trying to get everything with a y on one side and everything else on the other. 2x does not have a y with it, so I move it over. Now what am I left with? x times y minus y equals 2x plus 1. Now look, I can factor out a y. These have a common factor of y. So if I pull out a y out front, I have y times x minus one, right? And look, if I distribute this back in and multiply it out, I get right back to where I started. So that's how I can confirm that I did this correctly. Now look, if I divide both sides by x minus one, I have the y by itself and I've solved for y. So I'm gonna go ahead and move that up here. I'll write it right here, y equals, and I just divide both sides by x minus one x minus one, there we go. So that eliminates this x minus one, leaves up with the y on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we have two x plus one over x minus one. So our last step is to what? Just replace the y with that inverse notation. And now we're just gonna verify that these are inverses of each other. All right, let's confirm that these are inverses of each other. Let's verify this. I'm gonna start with the inverse as my inner function. So I'm plugging the inverse function into the original. I replace everywhere where I see x, I replace it with this inverse function. So I have 2x plus 1 over x minus 1 plus 1. That's my numerator. Denominator is 2x plus 1 over x minus 1 minus 2, okay? And again, the steps you can take to solve this uh, may be different than mine, but as long as you get to the correct answer, then do it whatever way it makes most sense to you. So I'm going to multiply by x minus 1 over 1 over x minus 1 over 1. And this is technically just x minus 1 over x minus 1, but I write the two fractions to, I don't know, it just visually makes more sense to me. So again, do whatever you please. So this is going to cancel, and I'll be left with a 2x plus 1. And that's going to be plus 1 times x minus 1. So that's plus x minus 1. That's what I'm left with on top. 
on bottom again these cancel I'm left with 2x plus 1 that was the point of this to get rid of this denominator right minus 2 and be real careful with the with the algebra here times x minus 1 because this minus it actually distributes into the x and the negative 1 so that's going to become a plus 2 let's go ahead and simplify this plus 1 minus 1 2x plus x that's 3x on the bottom I have 2x plus 1 minus 2 times x that's 2x 2x plus 1 minus 2x and then negative 2 times negative 1 that's plus 2 2x minus 2x that cancels and I'm left with what 3x over 3 which gives me x so we've confirmed it one way now let's go the other way all right let's verify this the other way this time my inner function is the original function so I'm taking this inverse and everywhere I see x I'm replacing it with that function the original function so I have 2 times x plus 1 x minus 2 over x minus 2 sorry plus 1 and then here with this x I just replace it with that as well x plus 1 x minus 2 and this is all minus 1 so now I'm going to go ahead and multiply by and you see a pattern here I'm always trying to get rid of the fractions so if I multiply by x minus 2 over 1 over x minus 2 over 1. When I multiply this out, it gets rid of this x minus 2. And I could distribute that 2 in first if you feel more comfortable that way. But this does get rid of this x minus 2. I'm left with 2 times x plus 1. You just have to remember those parentheses. Because I still haven't distributed that 2 in, right? Plus what? x minus 2. And technically, one have parentheses here because if this is a minus, you have to distribute it in. It's a good habit to get into. So all over what? This x minus 2 is gone. I'm left with x plus 1 minus, and again, that's why we do the parentheses to avoid mistakes at this step. This is the most common place to make mistakes. So if I uh, simplify this a little bit, I'm going to distribute the 2 in. I get 2x plus 2 plus x minus 2 all over what? I'm going to distribute basically this negative. So I'm left with x plus 1 minus x. And again, this is kind of like a negative 1 out in front, right? So negative 1 times x, that's minus x, plus 2. 2x two plus x. The 2 and the minus 2 will cancel. Let's see. The x and the minus x will cancel. So I'm left with 3 on the bottom, 1 plus 2. And then on top, I'm left with 3x, which just equals x. All right, let's finish up the video, finding the domain and range. My phone is on like 3%. I'm hoping I make it. So again, the domain of f of x will start with this. So what can't I plug in for x? Just 2, right? Because that's what makes the denominator 0. So any other real number is fine, just not 2. So I'm going from negative infinity to 2, not including 2, all the way up to infinity. And that means that what? This is my range for the inverse, because we have confirmed that these are inverses. So the domain of my original function is the range of my inverse. Now I'm just going to find the domain of the inverse function. So what can't I plug into this inverse function? x equals 1, right? I can't plug in 1. That gives me 0 in the denominator. So from negative infinity to 1, union 1 to infinity and that means that that's the range of my original function from negative infinity to 1 and then from 1 to infinity. And some people write this in a such that notation. So something like this, they'll write x such that x does not equal 1. And that's acceptable as well. I've just always done interval notation, so that's what I write it. But okay, so we found the domain and range of the original function as well as its inverse. I hope this video has helped. Sorry, it's a little bit long, but hopefully this has helped. Any comments? Leave the questions in the comments. Hit like and subscribe if you enjoyed and stay tuned for more videos. We'll keep flexing those brain muscles and make some more brain gains.